Hey everyone, just a little disclaimer here. Today's episode features a little bit of explicit content and some not so kid friendly language and discussion. Uh, Pretty Woman has a lot of talk about solicitation and sex work, and today's episode will go into it a little bit. So uh, if you're listening with your children, which you may be, uh, you know, uh, take caution, maybe, maybe skip this one and, and go back to our episode about uh, Mac and Me or Charlie St. Cloud, uh, because those are very kid-friendly movies and high recommendations from The Critical Breakdown. Or you can try this new Donna Fart industry innovation. Uh, It's called called Mama's Watching. All right, so you're watching a movie, you know, you got, maybe maybe you're putting on Pretty Woman, let's say, and um, there's sex scenes and stuff, you know? I mean, there's, there's a main character, a prostitute, and, you know, Mom can't always, mom can't always put the hand over your eyes. So what you do is you put these special mama's watching glasses uh, on your head. Totally clear, you know, uh, you know, prescriptionless frames, but it's got a big swinging hand out to the side. And you program a movie in, you hit play on the glasses at the same time, you hit play on that Blu-ray or on that uh, Amazon VOD, and... The movie is synced with the glasses to cover your eyes when mama doesn't want you to see it. And if you use the promo code BREAKDOWN, you get a free programmed Pretty Woman pair of mama's watching glasses. Uh, So go ahead and go to the website uh, uh, www.mamacares.com and you can buy the glasses and you can also buy the pre-programmed uh, versions for all the movies that just came out with uh, a program for the human centipede part two um, it's mostly with the hand over your eyes but you know you get to see some of the credits and that, and that's pretty cool so that's mama's mama's always watching another Donna fart industries innovation Welcome to The Critical Breakdown, the podcast where we start at the bottom of Rotten Tomatoes and we work our way to 100% fresh. I'm Max. And I'm Jody. And today we're going to be talking about Pretty Woman, rated 61% on Rotten Tomatoes. And unfortunately, our standard co-host, Scott Tennant, is traveling out of town for personal reasons. But Jody decided to pick up the uh, pick up the torch and, and help us out and pick up the sangria. Here's to you, Scott. That's right, Scott. Uh, yeah. So Jody, what you been up to? What you been watching? Um. So I'd be lying if I said I only watched these things to prepare for watching Pretty Woman. But Netflix did a dump of some pretty salacious British TV, including a documentary called. I think it's called 30 year old virgins about people who had never had sex and see a sex therapist to lose their virginity. And they were really weird. And I watched that, which led me down a rabbit hole. This British man who'd never even like kissed a woman was seeing this sex therapist from LA or San Francisco. Who was this way out there old lady. And There was a movie made about her called The Sessions starring Helen Hunt, where she's a sex therapist to help a paraplegic guy have sex for the first time. So I watched that. Those aren't really related to prostitution. So I also watched the Netflix gym escorts about two hookers in London who are very classy ladies. um, And their lifestyle compares in no way to Pretty Woman, which we'll get into later. So that's about it. And I watched 13 Reasons Why, and I don't know why. It was pretty awful, so I don't want to talk about it. There you go. We've we've had uh, Scott watch some of that before, and it's, I think some previous guests have watched it. I yeah. have no interest in it, honestly. Well, I watched it for you, so yeah. you don't have to. It was I really won't. just the, the part that kept me from really getting into it was how heavily tattooed all these high school sophomores were. It just didn't feel believable. No one has that much ink in high school. Well, I am not in high school anymore, so I can't vouch for that. But I will say uh, I don't have that much ink, so I'll side with you. Great. Max, what have you been watching? 
Well, with the release of the Stranger Things 2 trailer, I decided to revisit the first season because I don't want to watch it directly back to back because I want it to be fresh but not right there because the next season's set about a year later. So I want a little bit of gap there in my rewatch, but I decided to revisit it. And uh, you've actually been joining me in this revisit, so I have. Uh, I find it just as enjoyable, if not even more so, on my second viewing. Same here. It's so good. I love those kids. Yeah, the kids are really good. Uh, Hopper. Hopper's amazing. Winona Ryder's performance is even better the second time around because her hysteria, you know what's going on and you know how much she's giving into this performance. It's good stuff. Oh, for sure. I think that's everyone's worst nightmare to have a paranormal experience and no one believes you. I don't know if it's everyone's worst nightmare, but it's definitely your worst nightmare. It's top top five nightmares. No, I really enjoyed uh, revisiting it. The first episode still as good as I remember. I really enjoyed the third episode, which is where they discover... Uh, spoilers. Wait. Here be spoilers. <laughs> which is where they discover Will's body, uh, which is actually not his body, but everyone thinks it is, and the kids are having a real hard time with it. And there's a David Bowie cover playing, and it was just it's just a real powerful moment. And you may have cried while we watched that. You know, that's private information there. So, you're a sensitive guy. Speaking of, I also watched Suspiria, which is an, it's an Argento horror film. It's about a dance school. It's kind of famous. A lot of people put it in their like top lists of films. What was it like a scary horror film? I didn't think it was scary. The music's amazing. Visually, it's really cool looking. I thought it was really boring personally, but it just didn't bring me in. Mm. Um, Speaking of movies that just really didn't bring us in, do you want to get to talking about Pretty Woman? Sure. I mean, I had some more thoughts on Suspiria. Oh, sorry. Yeah. That that was a good bringer back, (laughs) but I had some more thoughts, which was just uh, the... I'm guessing this is every cut, but the dubbing was very poor it wasn't the strongest dubbing i've seen i don't know if that can be super distracting yeah and uh i thought as far as editing it was kind of jarring editing which maybe that was the point but i will say the highlights of the film for sure are the visuals like the colors are very bright and cool looking um there's some cool uh what am i saying framing in the shots there's a lot of shots that are framed very well and the music is amazing i will say that's for sure the highlight of the film yeah so uh if you've seen the movie juno right yeah at one point uh, i believe the main character juno mentions it's her favorite horror film and uh jason bateman's character says well you need to watch the wizard of gore so if you've heard of it that's probably the easiest spot where you've heard of it so it's mentioned I wouldn't though, have remembered. so anyway you were saying Oh, I was saying, let's start talking about Pretty Woman, which I have been referring to as Sexy Lady. Yeah. Wrong title, for sure. Max, what's the plot synopsis of this movie? A man in illegal but hurtful business needs an escort for some social events and hires a beautiful prostitute he meets, only to fall in love. Mm -mm. Now, I had seen most of this movie before. I mean, it's kind of iconic. Uh, which is one of the reasons me and Scott had selected to watch this film. Um, I think he might have been in the same boat where he knew the key parts, but he hadn't seen it. Uh, he can he can touch on that when, when he returns to us. But uh, with him leaving town, he was like, well, I think Jodie's the perfect fit for this film. She could bring a lot of nuance in her discussion with it. So he asked you to come fill in. Yeah. And I was like, heck yeah, I'll watch pretty woman definitely not called sexy lady and i've never seen it before so i'm really looking forward to this i only knew the scene where and i had never even seen the scene i just knew there was a scene where she walked into a store on rodeo drive and said big mistake huge yeah and that was it so i i asked you the other day to tell me your thoughts on the film before seeing it and yep. so I'm going to play that real quick to get uh, to get your hot take on what the movie's about before you ever watched it. Yeah. And before you play that, I just want to preface it with, I was pretty much accurate. I'll give you at least 50% accuracy, maybe more. 60. We'll, we'll get into it after I, I play this. Got it. So in my head, the plot synopsis is that Julia Roberts is like some 
trash backwoods country girl who uh, really wants to live in the big city and realizes she doesn't have the talents uh, or job to make it in the big city, so she becomes a prostitute. And I don't know if she'd be like a high-class prostitute if, if we're going with this. She's a backwoods trash person. Um, but somehow, she's beautiful, so she ends up uh, spending the night with Richard Gere's character, and she's so hot that he's like, I want to be with you forever. And she's like, but I'm just a prostitute. I don't know how to be in love. And then, because um, you can make a lot of money being an escort, so maybe Richard Gere offers to be like her sugar daddy so she doesn't have to be a whore anymore. And then she messes up and starts like having sex with other Johns and Richard Gere's like, I need you to make a decision. Are you going to just be with me? And she's like, I don't know what to do. I just make so much money being a prostitute. Uh, and then at some point in the movie, she like buys that fancy dress and, um, and then they end up together happily ever after and they live totally normal life and have like two kids and a dog and a white picket fence. And that's pretty woman. So yeah, you were, <laughs> like I said, about 50% right. You got the beginning, like, kind of square. Okay, so things that were correct. Backwoods prostitute. She was from Georgia. Backwoods girl. Backwoods girl. Who became a prostitute. Became a prostitute because she couldn't afford the big city. She lands Richard Gere. The part where I strayed was with her struggling to love him and giving up prostitution. And making that a ton of money. Happen. She did not Having other make jobs. a lot of money. Um, but he did offer at one point to be her sugar daddy. He sure did. So, like I said, you got about 50% right there. Yeah, I was in the spirit. The beginning yeah. and the end were correct. To be fair, though, now that I think about it, what you knew for sure was that she's the hooker with a heart of gold and she's a pretty woman. It's true. So why did we pick this movie? Well, like I said, it's it's iconic. Uh, me and Scott were just like, it might not be important to cinema as a piece, but uh, for the genre... I mean, this this kind of brought a rom-com resurgence back. Like, the 90s were big on rom-coms, early 90s, and this was one of the reasons why. Yeah, and it's been a while since you guys have watched a say, rom-com on the pod. I would say, like, this and When Harry Met Sally are, like, the big ones from the 90s that kind of brought money back to the genre. Ugh, just grosses me out thinking about comparing this movie to When Harry Met well, Sally. Well, yeah, yeah, it should. Uh, other films that we could have watched and talked about were the uh, Evil Dead remake. And we both saw this one before. So Evil Dead, uh, the reason I told Scott we can't watch it is because it's one of the goriest movies I've ever seen. And I knew he wouldn't go for that. Oh, God. When she saws her arm off with that turkey cutter, he would have yeah. died. Yeah. Uh, Hulk, the Ang Lee Hulk. Um, I, th- I think... The Ang Lee Hulk? Ang Lee, the director. Oh, I thought you meant like he was really angular. <laughs> okay. That's that's a first. Um <laughs> I think I think the CG in this had him very spongy looking. It was weird. I uh, didn't see so it. It was not so. an angular Hulk. Uh, the Patriot. That's kind of a romantic comedy. I don't think it is at all. But what's funny is I think uh, I think that that one's a guilty pleasure for both me and Scott. So we were just like, well, we could do that. But we've done we've done plenty of those recently. Uh, then probably the two with the biggest draw after after the Patriot would be Ten Things I Hate About You. It's definitely a better film than this, I think. Absolutely. And then uh, Interview with the Vampire, which is also a better rom-com than this. And it's not even a rom-com. Yeah. It's a better romance, for sure. It is, yeah. So I was feeling good about Pretty Woman until I saw this list, and now I'm kind of sad that we didn't get to watch 10 Things I Hate About You. Yeah, but, I mean, you got to think, when we're picking films, we always look at what has the biggest impact as well as what we want to watch. Um. 10 Things I Hate About You, I think I think it, you know, it's good. It's fun. It's definitely a fresh film. But, you know, comparatively and for the, the 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 art of film, what did it do? Compared to Pretty Woman kind it of re- introduced us to Heath Ledger. Yeah. I mean, that's all you got, though. And he's dead. So, I mean, close that door. Well, that's weird. So, how did Pretty Woman do in the box office? Well, it's funny you should ask that. Although Scott can't be here for this episode, he sent a little uh, a little tidbit for us. This is the magic of technology. 
Hey guys, this is Scott here with The Critical Breakdown. Uh, first off, Jody, thanks for stepping in. Sorry everyone that I couldn't be on this episode, but uh, Pretty Woman is a movie that I am looking forward to watching as soon as I can. I did want to hit you with those box office numbers, though, uh, as I usually do, and Pretty Woman's a really interesting movie at the box. It opened March 23rd of 1990 to an opening of uh, of 11.3 million, which doesn't seem too high, but it did win its weekend over Hunt for Red October. Um, it then went on in its second week to go up to 12.5 million, so that probably implies some pretty good word of mouth, even though 61% doesn't make you think a lot about it uh, critically, but uh, it is kind of a cultural touchstone, I feel like. Um, it ended up having winning its week one, seven, eight, and nine, so some incredible longevity. It was in the top five of the box office for 12 weeks, uh, putting it at a total domestic run of $178.4 million, which on a $14 million budget is incredible. It's number four of 1990, behind Home Alone, Ghost, and Dances with Wolves. Uh, what's kind of interesting is the 12 weeks it was in theaters there, it was Pretty Woman, Hunt for Red October, and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles all in the box at the same time and all in the top three for pretty much all those weeks uh, until the end of its run where other movies had come out and started to top it out. Uh, what I think is kind of interesting, too, is uh, Richard Gere and Julia Roberts also starred together in Runaway Bride in 1999, which has a much, uh, much lower Rotten Tomatoes score at 46%, but it was also directed by Gary Marshall. Uh, so the comparison is interesting. It made $152 million in its total domestic run, so it did less than Pretty Woman, but its budget was $70 million, which is over five times as high. So um, couldn't quite match what they did with Pretty Woman. Pretty Woman is Richard Gere's highest-grossing movie and Julie Roberts' second-highest grossing behind Ocean's Eleven. But uh, a really interesting run there for Pretty Woman. So Jody and Max, I'll let you guys take it back from here. Thanks. Thanks, Scott. Max, tell us about this director. I don't know who he is. Well, it's uh, Gary Marshall, and you might know his other film that we just mentioned, Runaway Bride. You might also know some of his other work, including The Princess Diaries. Uh, he directed Beaches, The Other Sister. I love The Other Sister. The Princess Diaries 2, Royal Engagement. Ooh. Um, Georgia Rule, and more recently he did a couple of the holiday films, Mother's Day and New Year's Eve and Valentine's oh Day. Oh, God, those garbage movies. Yeah. I would definitely say uh, I, I do like The Princess Bride, I'll say. Wait, he did The Princess Bride? Not The Princess or the Bride. Princess, okay, the, the Princess Diaries. Princess Diaries. I read yeah, Princess and, and Diaries and, and Runaway movie. Bride at the same time. I got confused. And you made a better uh, movie. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, Princess Diaries, I enjoyed the first one. I never saw the sequel, but the first one's it's cute. And it was written by J.F. Lawton. Speaking of the writing, uh, the, the screenplay was actually pretty different when it started. But in order to talk about it, I think we have to learn something. Let's learn something today. Welcome to this week's segment of Let's Learn Something. The plot to Pretty Woman is based on the Pygmalion myths, My Fair Lady, all that stuff. So that's what it it turned into. But it began as a dark drama about prostitution. It was originally written for Edward to dump Vivian, that's Julia Roberts' character, on the side of the road and her leaving with her friend on a bus to Disneyland. Why Disneyland? Because this film was filmed on Disney lots, maybe. Um, and Vivian was also a drug addict, and her friend ODs uh, when Vivian leaves to be with Edward. But they changed all that because it's really depressing. That's not what gets the American housewife out to see a movie. Am I right? So they um, change all that. That's uh, reflected in the floss scene, correct? When. Uh Edward walks to the bathroom. He expects to find her doing drugs and threatens to kick her out. But oh, she's yeah. uh, she's flossing. She's like, I don't want to see you pick stuff, me pick stuff out of my big old horse teeth with floss. She doesn't sound like that. Not but. at all. And she doesn't really say that either. But she, does she did have, have strawberries old. in her teeth. So. She does have big um, old horse teeth, too. 
But yeah, so uh, it, it's kind of interesting how it began more realistic and was like a really dark drama. Yeah, and it probably would have been a much better movie had it been well, realistic. That's and debatable, but at least you could say we learned something today. We learned something. Let's learn something today. Great. Well, I feel real uh, learned up right now. Learned. Learned. Now, uh, I think everyone knows Richard Gere and Julia Roberts in this film. Yeah. And pretty much they are the only characters of significance except for Jason Alexander. This is... Um, it's early Jason Alexander. Yeah, I mean, this he, is. Uh, he still had like, think, the fuzzy part of his bald spot. Was still covered in that like peach fuzz hair, so he wasn't fully bald yet. Seinfeld in it was in its first season. season. Yeah. So he was probably filming this movie while he was in the first season of yeah, Seinfeld. Yeah. Which is a huge jump for him, and I think Seinfeld probably helped his career a lot because he plays a real skeezy guy in this. And I mean, don't get me wrong, George Costanza is pretty skeezy, but not like this. But not a rapist. Uh, no. And this character is definitely at that level. So yeah. uh, you plays. also have Ralph Bellamy in this film. Is who, he the uh, guy that runs the hotel? No, he is the businessman that uh, Edward's dealing with the whole time. People might know him more from movies like uh, Trading Places. He played one of the two rich brothers that are uh, making the bet on Eddie Murphy. The old white guy? The old white guy. Okay. He's in a ton of stuff. Um, then you have Laura San Giacomo who plays her other prostitute friend. Mm -hmm. Um, She was from the sitcom Just Shoot Me. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I recognize her teeth. She has that uh, gap. She has a distinct look to her. Um, It bothered me for like 20 minutes. I was like, what is she from? What is she from? Then I remembered. And then the guy who runs the hotel, Hector Elizondo. He might be one of my favorite characters in the movie. He's a great character actor. He's actually worked a lot with Gary Marshall. He was in Runaway Bride and The Princess Diaries, as well as a couple of his other movies so he kind of plays the same type of character um sassy kind of vaguely euro or ethnic um but i enjoy him he's funny in this yeah he was and then there was a bit part by hank azaria which i got so excited when i saw hank azaria playing a detective and i wrote it down in my notes i was like oh hank azaria is the detective he's gonna for sure be riding her butt trying to out her as a hooker and then he never showed up again i just hit the table really hard sorry um and if you've seen something uh else that he's been in obviously he's in the simpsons he was uh the latin lover boy in the bird cage the bird cage and he's kind of a scene stealer in the bird cage so when you see him in this if you've never seen it before you're like oh like i'm excited for this hank is area he's and gonna he's gonna steal the show nothing it's, it's a 10 second part at best So that's kind of a letdown, but uh, we did realize the first half of this film, I mean, it has some good jokes in it. Can I, can I give you one? Sure. Yeah. So uh, when Edward first picks Vivian up off the street corner and he's like, I don't know how to drive this fancy car and she hops in, she's going to give him directions for 10 bucks and it quickly escalates to her talking about how much money he would get and or how much money she would charge. And um, he's like, how much do you, would you charge? She's like, granted, he's driving like probably a $100,000 sports car. You couldn't afford it. So I was like, oh, damn, she's probably like $1,000 an hour. She's $100 an hour. And his response was, $100 an hour? That's stiff. And she responds by reaching her hand over and like, I guess caressing his junk. You don't see it, but it's It's implied. It's a crotch touch. A a crotch touch. And then she just goes, no, but it's got potential. Yeah. So there's a little bit of raunchy humor. Yeah. Hilarious. Um, And for the most part, it's it's smirk worthy, at least. Maybe in a a crowded theater, you can laugh. But for the most part, it's like, okay, like that's funny enough um, for the first half of the film. Yeah. But I think that was one of the few... That was probably like the jokes that yeah. was supposed to be a joke. Now we were laughing about a lot of stuff that was maybe not supposed to be funny. Yeah. Um, but real quick. Uh, so this movie begins with uh, it's, it's Richard Gere's character, Edward. He's at a dinner party. He gets dumped by his girlfriend. Oh God. Can we just talk about that dinner party for a second? 
Uh, real brief, because I know what you want to say, and it's not important for the plot. But well, it was important to me. So there was this high, ritzy group of ladies, and everyone had, like, the biggest scrunchies I've ever seen in my whole life in their hair. And it was just, like, Versace gowns and scrunchies. Versace. Versace. And it just really put me there. I was like, yeah. This is the 90s. You actually called them out. You said uh, for all these fancy dresses, they shouldn't be wearing scrunchies. Yeah, but but I then don't know. I debated was that with fancy you. Fancy back then. I debated with you. Maybe it was cutting edge to have scrunchies at the time at your dinner party. Very fashion forward. Yeah. Especially a velvet one. Yeah, velvet scrunchie. Um. Yeah. But so basically, Edward he kind of has a a panic attack and just wants to get out of there. Um. But he can't get his limo, so he takes uh, his friend. What's his name? Uh, Philip, that's his lawyer, and also his What's his last friend. name, though? It's like Philip Stucky? Philip Skeezeball, I don't know. It's like Stucky or something. Not important. Yeah, but, but a, It's uh, his lawyer yeah, and it's Stucky. friend. He, uh, he takes Stucky's car, which is a Lotus Esprit. Something. Um, and he just zips off in it. And he cannot drive a stick. He can't drive a stick. He's going to so strip he, he's that like, gear. Yeah, stripping the gears. He's driving around. It's... It's a funny scene because you see a man who should be a man in power. He's driving this car that he could barely handle. Then he goes and this conversation with Julia Roberts happens. Uh, her friend says, go go get this guy. He has no idea what he's doing, so you could probably make some money. Um, she decides to make the deal for directions. He takes off driving. She's like, you are you don't know what you're doing to this machine. Here's where my first issue of the film actually starts. Ooh, Do you want to know what way. it is? Yeah, yeah, go. Uh, it, it speaks to Vivian's character that everything she kind of has that's good is from men. Um, she knows about cars because all the guys back home used to work on cars, and that's why she knows about cars. It's not because she likes cars. And that's actually, like that's how it was worded. She was just like, oh, yeah, all the boys back home used to work on cars, so I picked up a little bit about working on cars. Um, of the three big references, well, four big references she makes to her childhood and growing up, one is about guys and cars, uh, one is about, I think, hooking up with the band camp or something, or debate team, but she was joking. And then she s- switches that one to be, my grandfather, me and him were really close, so I learned how to tie ties from him. And the last one was her dream of like being in a fairy tale, rescued by a prince. So it's like all of her goals and all of her background, all the positive stuff of her character revolve around her relationship to men. And I just feel like if you're trying to build a strong character here, that's not the best way to do it. Well, she isn't supposed to be a strong female character, so maybe those are pretty stereotypical things for her. I mean, to have yeah, had in her but life. I'm saying just like strong character-wise, all of her like positive motivations are directly related to like these male influences. Just a little thing that bothered me. That's what I'm saying. Well, you know what bothered me? What's that? Is that she couldn't do math, and maybe that was because of a man too maybe she had a really bad male math teacher well she did say she had an 11th grade education well by the 11th grade you should know that one hour at 100 dollars an hour and one night which would be at least five to six hours is not 300 dollars a night uh, which richard gears character points out he's like okay i can afford maybe it's, that it's bulk pricing or something yeah he gets that discount out <laughs> It cuts in half the price every hour. You get it yeah. for half price. Um, so he takes her back to stay at this really fancy hotel, and he's in the penthouse at the top. And I was thinking, like, God, this hotel is really fancy. Can't wait to see a bitch in penthouse. It's gonna be super gaudy, like Donald Trump, like gold everywhere. And it and it was gaudy, but like in the worst way. Yeah. It was like Santa Fe. Everything was like Santa Fe desert colors. But then there was Zen Asian fusion furniture everywhere. It was a very confusing design A couple of marble columns too, I believe. And um, is, is that just speaking to like when you have that much money, you have no taste anymore? You're just like, what's the most expensive I stuff mean, I can decorate with? I think that was legitimately like fancy 90s decor at the time. That was awful. I mean, you got to think the 90s, uh, right here, 1990, that's the tail end of the 80s, really. That's, like, where it all meets up. Uh, when you think of films we watched, like uh, Weekend at Bernie's, a lot of the designs were similar to this. Not as upscale, but similar in, like, colors and tones. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, they go to this hotel. They make this deal to stay the night. And then the next day, yep. um, he, he kind of... You see we- Edward 
enjoying her presence and her company more than he's probably enjoyed anybody in a long time. Yeah, they make she's... that clear, and that's a kudos to the filmmaker because you pick up on it that he's genuinely enjoying her company. Because it's like watching a kid discover stuff for the it's first time. It's a sexy time. kid, which is weird. I mean... She's yeah. watching... Uh, Has she been like wearing a really distractingly ugly blonde wig when he picked her up, and yeah. then her real hair comes out? And I also did appreciate that... Um, after she told him that he couldn't afford $300 a night, that she then proceeded to invite herself to a carpet picnic where she pretty much emptied out the entire mini bar with all the snacks, which was way more than $300 worth of food and was just watching. I love Lucy. Yeah. And then this is, this is where their first encounter happens. Um, which we don't see, we don't see, uh, it's implied. Was there any steaminess in this first encounter with the sofa, the, the love seat, for kissing his chest. God. Okay. So I would have liked for there to have been. And we talked about this a little bit last night. When you watch a movie where there's going to be sex scenes and not even sex scenes, but kissing any romance, like when there's real chemistry, like you feel that as the audience member and you're excited. You're like, I can't wait. Like the tension builds. And there was none of that watching these two on screen. And they're both very attractive people, but it just, yeah. Oh, didn't do it for me. I mean, like, they I didn't had, believe that they were actually sexually attracted to each they other. They had like friendship chemistry at at moments where you could see that they get along well. Uh but the romance there it, it wasn't really there for me either. Um And you had said something that you wanted to know if I thought he was like coming off as kind of like Asperger's or autistic a little bit. The first act of this film, he's so like emotionless that I thought maybe he was playing it that way. Um which is to say Which nothing. Honestly, would have made for a much more interesting. Oh, plot. for sure. Um, but I, I, I mean, as the film goes on, you could tell he's not playing it that way. But it just felt like that at first because he's so um, immobile yeah. in a lot of interactions. But I did read uh, Gary Marshall at one point uh, stopped Richard Gere because he was engaging really hard in the film and told him, "You need to be the one who's like immovable while Julia Roberts moves around you the whole time, basically." So like. He, the director literally said, "You can't be this engaging." Um, He's got but, those I mean, sparkly eyes. I he mean, it's does. probably hard for him. A little to turn twinkle the in his eye down. there, but uh, old pappy gear. Uh, the basic plot here moves where Edward has a bunch of business he has to take care of. He's trying to get a company. I thought he's you were trying to save money, which he has a bunch of that too. Well, yeah, he's trying to break apart this this massive like a uh, shipbuilding company. Mm-hmm split up the assets, get super rich for him and his company, and then disperse all the people in that company. Basically vulture capitalism. Um, and he needs, uh, and Stucky keeps telling him, you need a date to go meet with this guy. Yep. He needs a date. So the big, I mean, the big middle of this movie is getting her ready to be his date. It's the oh, Pygmalion section. And it takes a lot to get her ready. Yeah. And this is where the uh, the hotel guy, Hector, that actor, he, he comes into play. Because she can't navigate Rodeo Drive like somebody yeah. with money, even though she has all the money, the ladies are mean to her. She doesn't have access. And that scene was, it made me feel bad for her. It's not, I mean, it's a, there's a reason that scene's classic. Like, yeah. I mean, there's no way to deny that that scene isn't like the most iconic scene from this movie, with the exception of maybe like the necklace snap in the jewelry box that comes later when he dresses her up and gives her the jewelry. And then he closes the box oh, yeah. and she laughs which you hate her laugh apparently but uh she's famous for her laugh but that was an improv scene that was uh, he just did that out of the blue and they liked Cute. her reaction so much that they kept it in there they're like that laugh was so loud but Love this is it. this is the first half of the big mistake scene yeah so they're like you don't belong in here you need to leave you can't afford this you can't afford this yeah. so then she leaves she's she's saddened but she goes over to the hotel and the concierge again is like, honestly, you just can't be walking around in your hooker clothes. We need to fix this. And she's like, well, I tried. They were mean to me. Yep. So then, then he bros out for her and he's like, I got this. Come to my office. He calls like his personal stylist or something and has her dressed. Yeah. He calls um, the stylist at the whatever department store. And he's yeah. like, Mr. What is Edward's m- last name? I forget. Mr. It's, it's Edward. Like Woodward or Willard yeah, or something. He's like Mr. Edward's niece is going to be coming by and she's a very special client um and the shop lady at the department store was super nice she was so sweet and vivian was like how did you know what size i am how are you picking out clothes for me and she's looking at her like because it's my job yeah you look cute it's it's 
it's a good section, even though, like, it's an enter- it's an entertaining section. It's easy to watch this part of the film. Yeah, um, I also liked when uh, Vivian was walking upstairs to the dressing room with a sales lady, and she t- feels the need to tell her that she's not really Edward's niece. She's like, "I'm not. He, he's not really my uncle." And the sales lady just looks at her and says, "They never are." Yeah, which yeah. Is weird. That was a funny line. I it thought was, that was funny. It was. Um, yeah, and I mean, from here, the film pretty much it's. It's your standard stuff, what you expect with this plot line. Yeah. She's bad at fitting in, but she's charming with it. I mean, it's, uh, like we said, it's Pygmalion. It's, you There's know. a lot of mont. I feel like it was, and it probably wasn't, but like in my head, it was just a giant montage from that point forward. Well, this, this section has out and some shopping. montages, yeah, with with the big mistake thing where she goes and tells off the women who, who scared her off before and shows like the expensive clothes in the bags. Leading up to that is the big montage of spoiling her. She's eating pizza. Mm-hmm. They're covering her in diamonds, he all this her, and that. He ordered everything on the menu for her at breakfast because he didn't know what she'd want to eat. Yeah, and we laughed a lot at this just because... like a crappy Denny's breakfast. Yeah, it was like a basket <laughs> of croissants, like a fruit bowl, and then eggs, bacon, and pancakes on a plate, which is a great breakfast, don't get me wrong, but it looks so plain and normal. Well, it's sad to see a, a big white plate with like four strips of bacon yeah. on it. And it was just, it was just like... 90s food basically at its height so there was probably like parsley on one of the plates which made it fancy made it fancy um so yeah now in your films nowadays you'll see culinary delights of much more heights that was a a nice rhyme thank you nice play on words uh yeah uh one of the big scenes here the build-up is the dinner the famous dinner scene where he she tells uh, edward to just order for her and then he orders fancy rich people food and there's like I don't know what it is like pate or something that she can't know. work her way through. Gross. And then uh, then there's escargot, and she's trying to figure out how to do that. This scene, uh, she ends up tossing a snail, and the waiter catches it and says it happens all the time. And then Gary Marshall actually used that again in the Princess Diaries. The same thing happens with a snail. Yeah, with escargot and like tosses it. And oh, it's kind of Happens cute. all the time. So. Kind of cute. Uh, I, I do like, appreciate that oh. Gary Marshall leans in on his properties here. There's a lot of repeat going on. It's um, Do your thing, Gary. Somebody out there likes it. <laughs> and to be fair, a Princess Diaries is a different audience. They probably wouldn't have picked up on that, but their moms <laughs> might have. When Maybe. They went to see it. Um, I did like this is where her Georgia charm came out, where she's like, I'm sorry, I only know how to use one of these forks. And then the old rich guy's like, oh, yeah. me too. And they both just start eating with their hands. And it's obviously a way that she's like endearing herself and in turn endearing um, Edward's character yeah. as much as he's able to be endearing um, to this guy. This business yeah. And person. there's, I mean, there's definitely a connection there where he, she brings out the better half of him. That's what they're going for. Uh, he slows down. He has fun. I mean, it's, it's yeah. funny to go back and see this now because I've seen so many other movies that do it better. Like think of like uh, the Amy Adams cartoon movie Enchanted. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's like they do this better than this movie basically uh, where she gets the dad to like slow down and have a good time and enjoy mm-hmm. life again, you know. Uh, and it's interesting because she's changing him to some extent. We'll get into that later. Yeah. but. She hasn't really changed. I mean, aside from just having thousands of dollars worth of clothes on. Externally, at this point, she's only changed externally. Yeah. Yeah. Internally, she's still just a hooker with a heart of gold. Yeah. Now, that begins to change throughout the film, like from this point on. Yeah. She's Uh, fully transitioned into looking like a suburban mom. Yeah, like I mean, a she's rich wearing fancy suburban clothes, mom. You know, she's wearing those like knee-length and necklaces shorts. and stuff. So, uh, for some reason, Edward decides to tell Stucky, the creepiest guy around, that uh, his new girlfriend isn't actually a girlfriend. Oh, Stucky was freaking out, thinking it was a corporate espionage. She oh, just yeah. shows up and she's perfect for Because they were at you. a polo match, yeah. and she started talking to the rich businessman's son, and so Stucky's like, "Where did you find her? She's spying. Yeah. She's trading secrets." And so Edward said, in a fit of jealousy over her talking to the other guy, he tells Stucky that she's actually a hooker. Stucky goes over and is, like, rubbing her shoulder and, like, hey, maybe after this week, me and you can get together. Stucky's wife is across the room, by the way. He's a classy but, uh, guy. Classy guy. Uh, 
so she gets really mad understandably yeah. and um, she she confronts edward about it yeah. she said don't ever do that again um you know when i basically when she's dressed the way she was dressed then as a rich suburban mom she wasn't in the state of mind to handle someone addressing her a like gross she was dude. a hooker yeah. yeah so she's like i mean when i'm dressed like me when i'm me and i'm on the street i can handle that i can tell him where to put it tell him to buzz off but it just caught her so off guard you could tell she was really um hurt but I, I like that as a character moment i do think that it works yeah. like her armor was off basically um and from there there's like a lot of well here uh she demands her money and that she's done she's oh, yeah. she's leaving she's like, so he just like money. without even looking he just throws like a wad of cash a huge amount of cash there was some hundred dollar um, bills just on the bed and she just looks at it her tears well up in her eyes and she leaves and then he comes back and tries to stop her and they kind of work it out that they won't do that again then they have this really intimate scene where they're like bathing each other um, we got at this point there's been full like gear nipples. no nudity and it just yeah. starts the close up of his nipples and we're like are those her no hair yeah what oh yeah. it's Richard Gear laying on her like a baby getting washed so uh, weird. and at, at that point they did have maybe their most real conversation because they talk about how she ended up in her situation and um, she's like well <laughs> nobody dreams of doing this it just happens yeah this and being, he he expands a sex worker on his background of just basically having daddy issues him and his dad so got into hard. a big fight he didn't talk to him for 15 years and his mm-hmm. dad died um which is comparable to being a sex worker <laughs> uh yeah but i mean you know you could look at it that way you could look at that they both had some issues family issues they had to work on um and i mean it just really seemed like they were making these connections here right yeah I guess so. I mean, they were supposed to. Yeah. Still was feeling no chemistry, but yeah. Yeah. They were connecting on a heart to heart level. So, for like th- things kind of change from here for both of them. Um she the week's up and she realizes yep. she doesn't really want to do this this way anymore cuz she's fallen for him. She might even say at this point like I love like, you or something. And they hadn't um kissed on the mouth at all cuz yeah. you know, hookers don't kiss you on the mouth. And he fell asleep, like, after they'd had that conversation. And she's just, like, so taken with her love for him that she starts kissing him on the mouth. Yeah. And he wakes up and kisses her and on the mouth. Bunch, and they're yeah. just like, oh, your mouth is a part of you, too. Um, so that discovery. And I think that's when we do see a little nip slip from Julia uh, Roberts. He throws her on the bed, but, like, the headboard's in the way. So you, like, barely see anything. And they dry hump each other. Yeah. And it was really um, anticlimactic. But then we move to the actual like nugget of the plot here where he goes to meet with the uh, the other uh, venture capitalist and break up the company. And then at the last second, he kind of has a change of heart, sends everyone out the room except uh, the old guy that he's been uh, telling he's going to take his company from him. And he's like, look, I've never built anything in my life. You have a company that built some- something. Instead of me taking apart your company, why don't we work together? Why don't I fund your company and you- we build things together? The guy's like, I don't know how you had to change a heart, but I appreciate it. Like, And don't get me wrong, I'm not meaning this facetiously. And he puts his hand on his shoulder and says, I'm proud of you. Almost like a father himself. Oh, gosh. So, true confession. I was really struggling to stay awake during this part of the, the movie. The movie slowed down God. halfway through. And we had just eaten like an incredibly heavy Italian meal for dinner. And it was just, it was all uh, just coming together for uh, me to fall asleep and so i don't remember that scene so, so thank you for sharing it with yeah. me uh so basically he he solves his daddy issues um what i woke up to is what happened next hold on i i did forget to mention uh i don't know if this happened before the daddy issue scene or after uh, which is where he proposes the oh, sugar daddy yeah, thing himself. Yeah, that was before. Yeah. Because he told So that's her, that's when she realized she doesn't want to do this anymore. Yeah, he's like, you know, I'm going to be going back to New York. I'll set you up with an apartment and a driver and basically like an allowance. She'll be a kept woman. Yeah, but like the deals on it pretty sweet. There's and, worse deals um, out there. Definitely. And that's when she said no and he, he went off to that meeting. And then I nodded off for maybe five minutes and woke up to Jason Alexander's Stucky. character, Stucky. Stucky attempting is furious. To rape her. Well, Stucky's furious that the venture capitalist deal ended. 
and that instead uh, Edward's going to work with him to build something furious and he can only think of one thing that's changed it Vivian so he shows up and starts shit talking her and then he says stuff like you know after after this week's done which is now like you know I'm just going to take you for a ride this and that and just saying really gross things and then he like slaps her across the face he throws her down and then he just jumps on her and does attempt to assault her and uh uh, Edward just comes out of nowhere and like throws him off and like punches I was him in the face because it seemed like Edward came from like out on the balcony. It and seemed like, like that, so I don't know where he came from. Was he even in the hotel? He's scared of heights, so he wouldn't do the balcony. That's true. Uh, that scene felt really not necessary yeah. to the plot at all. We already knew Stucky was a piece of crap. Like we didn't yeah. need him. So to basically, he fires that. Stucky, gets rid of Stucky. Um, this might actually be where the uh, the sugar daddy part happened. It happens in one of these moments, but yeah. she's like, I can't do this. I got to go. And so she does. She packs up all her fancy stuff that he bought her. Mm-hmm. And uh, she heads back to her trash hoe. <laughs> I was trying to say trash hoe. <laughs> I was trying to say her trash hotel. How about you start that over? And so she does. She packs up all of her stuff. She takes her money and she goes back to the trashy hotel that she lives in with her yeah. other hooker roommate um who by the way the the roommate prostitute is in the movie intermittently like she comes and stops by the hotel and gets money from vivian and they like sip at the pool and talk about life and it just really shows the contrast of where vivian's come from because mm-hmm. her friends it's dress her the way vivian yeah. used to and vivian's sitting there in like a three-piece short pantsuit um at the pool you know yeah. like you do so uh she goes back to her her roots but she says that she's going to san francisco and she's gonna go back to school she's gonna finish high school God, and she's I, just gonna start her life over with what like i guess she that she 3, had three grand three grand was enough honestly if she sold all those clothes She'd should have triple that easily. That's true, and we know from Party of Five that San Francisco was much more affordable in the early nineties. Yeah, yeah. than anybody it could is live now. there. So um, even a hooker. So then, of course, this is where your storybook ending happens. He realizes he made a mistake. It's kind of a funny rom com scene. Um, Huge. The hotel concierge says, uh, "I forgot his name, but Daryl. Let's just say Daryl. Daryl will take you where you need to go." He says that to Vivian. Daryl takes uh, her home in this mm-hmm. limo. And then when Richard Gere's like freaking out at the end, he's like, you know, what have I done? I should talk to her. The concierge is just like, Daryl will take you where you need to go with like a knowing smile. Mm -hmm. Of course, he ends up over at her trash hotel. Yep. And then an uh, umbrella and a newspaper. Umbrella and flowers. Flowers. And he uses the umbrella to pull down the fire escape and he climbs the tower to the princess. Overcoming his fears. Oh, wait. And then when she got rescued... He climbs up to rescue her and, like, says that, like, I'm climbing up uh, to rescue you. He's like, I'm rescuing you. And then she voices over and she rescues him, She said it, I thought. Like, basically, I rescued you. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And that was the end of Sexy Lady. Um, God, it just wasn't what I thought it would be. Yeah, I mean, it seems like it's going to be more of a vice type of film dealing with prostitution. It's not. Um, let me tell you from my research i did before we watched this movie nothing like the lives these escorts live oh well yeah any experience with this other than through movies but these girls are making like 500 dollars an hour and granted i guess that's if you're a high class escort with an online service to you know get your guys through but i don't know was a hundred dollars an hour a lot of money in 1990 i have no idea but it just feels like she wasn't really making that much money if she was living in a hotel especially since she wasn't drug addicted i could see if you're making a ton of money and like blowing it on drugs well you saw she was bad at math and her roommate kept stealing her money too maybe her roommate kept being like the rent's three hundred dollars and she would uh, give her like a thousand i feel had they gone with some of these other casting choices this film would have been vastly different uh first of all Molly Ringwald was in the running for this film. Uh, sh- it's one of her biggest regrets not taking it. Oh, I'm glad she didn't. And as much as I don't really care for Julia Roberts, Molly Ringwald would not have been a good fit for this movie. Not for how this movie is in its form. I think it could have been interesting to see the dark version, but with Molly Ringwald. Yeah, that's true. Um, she could play a great heroin addict. Sandra Bullock turned down this role, as did, I believe, Daryl Hannah. Daryl Hannah turned it down because she felt it was uh, a negative role. 
Like she didn't want to play something so negative uh, mm-hmm. because there was, like I said, very little characterization. I feel like Sandra Bullock and Julia Roberts are like interchangeable in a movie. Sandra Bullock's funnier. I feel like Sandra Bullock has more of the America's Sweetheart status, even more so than Julia Roberts. Speaking of, they made a movie called America's Sweethearts together, did they not? Uh, they might have. Maybe it wasn't Sandra Bullock. Somebody made that movie, though. Someone I agree. Else with that brown movie exists. Made that movie with Julia Roberts. Um, as far as Edward, some of your choices were Al Pacino. Ooh, I he like, screen I like tested, that. and I think he just did not do it. He didn't want to do it. Uh, Denzel Washington was considered. Oh, I like that. That would have yeah. been really interesting. Not um, as interesting as Burt Reynolds. Burt Reynolds. Uh, he turned it down, and then after he saw it and realized he could have had um, sexual scenes with Julia Roberts, he jokingly said, it's his biggest regret. So, there you go. The time he shaved his mustache off is probably still his biggest regret. Um, I think Denzel or Al Pacino, they would have been great. For the dark version? They would have been great. For the dark version. For the syrupy rom-com piece of trash that it is. Yeah. Richard Gere's fine They saved themselves. Yeah. Yeah. That's what Richard Gere's for. Yeah. He's like a warm body that women, with a handsome face that women can just, like, look at. It's just... He looks a lot like our friend Joe's dad. All right. Uh, so I figure we could uh, we can hit some questions here. Yeah. Um, how do you think this holds up as a rom-com compared to other rom-coms that have come since? God. That's not really my genre that I love. Um, uh, I beg to differ. <laughs> you like mostly bad ones. I love a bad rom-com. Yeah. Name one. Name one bad rom-com. Fool's Russian. Okay, that's a great rom com because it has Matthew Perry. Fever pitch. Fever pitch was funny, um, but I don't pay. Failure much. to launch. We watched that one one time. Yeah, but those are like things that you watch when you've like had a bottle of wine. It's and like it's the TBS, on TBS test that me and Scott always refer. These to. are things that you don't pay money to go see in a theater. I'm not going to debate that part with you, yeah. but I'm saying, how does Pretty Woman hold up compared to anything that's come since? Ah. Uh. probably the wrong person to ask for this because it wasn't funny like where was the calm in it it was i do think it was just like a weird it doesn't like, hold up that well romance. like comedy wise yeah no romance there's a little bit there um they have chemistry like i said in certain scenes but mm-hmm. it's just like she's only so believable as the hooker with a heart of gold um and i mean he's pretty stiff the whole time no pun intended uh yeah it's i if it wasn't for this podcast, I probably wouldn't revisit this no. movie. Um, like I said, I regret that this was our choice. And I have to live with that. I have to live with that decision. Uh, well, People don't just choose the life. Speaking Max. of, it was me and Scott's choice. It was. And I just got... Which leads to my next question. Victim of it. How do you feel about the gender roles in this film? Yeah, I hated it. And I am waiting, like, when we talked about this after the movie where is the role reversal version of this movie like where is the pygmalion story where a guy has his life changed by this awesome woman well uh last night i responded when you asked me that and said uh can't buy me love might be pretty close but it's still sparked by a guy wanting change he wants to be cool in his school he pays the cool girl at school to make him cool so it's kind of like a reverse pygmalion at points and they learn to fall in love through that. Um, there's some similarities. Uh, I think more so what you'll find is your manic pixie dream girl scenario where a quirky yeah. girl shows up, changes the guy for the better, and then leaves him like and fades off into the sunset. That counts, Although, but 500 Days of Summer really is actually... It's worse, it's, well, it's a commentary on, on that whole uh, trope, and a lot of people miss that, actually. Yeah. So Because he's kind of a piece of shit the whole time. Yeah. Well, I'm pretty smart. That's why so, I noticed it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think what I really don't like about it is it, it makes something that's really serious, sex work, um, just like the butt of a lighthearted rom-com, like, oh, you know, it's not that bad to be a hooker. You can yeah. be saved by your prince. And not that I think like teenage girls were watching this and idealizing prostitution and then running out west to be like, I want to be just like Vivian. Um, but I, I don't think that they did a service to the profession by treating it in that light. Um, especially 
Well, there's definitely a more nuanced take on this they can do. I mean, yeah. they don't do it, but no. there's definitely a more nuanced version it's of this that more, you could do. It's more just like a big joke. Like, yeah. oh, look at her thigh high boots and her like slutty outfit. Yeah. Oh, she's just like a a walking stereotype of a prostitute. And to be fair, that is what a lot of you know ladies of the night look like on the street corner. But like, th- and they showed them like when he was driving through the. Um, seedy part of town where all the prostitutes were on the street corners and they were showing like I don't know if they were or not but like drag queen looking prostitutes and like all kinds of characters who looked very authentic and then you get cut to like Julia Roberts who's like clean cut and like the cute one and she's the one that gets saved like I'm just imagining this being recast with um, I mean, there's just so many different, more interesting ways you could do it. It could be an interracial couple, you know, like yeah. it could, one of them, like even if it was Denzel Washington, that'd be interesting. If it was, you know, a black actress from the time, that would be interesting. Um, it could be, like you said, it, it, it could have been like a trans girl or something. I mean, there's, there's so many different ways that it, it could have been a weirder, more interesting, more honest take. Yeah. But... No, I mean it's it's and pretty just, traditional. Like, as traditional as this could be, it definitely hits all those it's super traditional. Yeah. And also she had like which good for her if she didn't, but she really didn't have any baggage from what she was doing. Like I know she said no nobody really chooses this life, but I mean she's a prostitute and she's yeah. around friends who are that like tangentially related to people well, who the like film opens with uh with the prostitute overdose yeah. in, the, in the dumpster but they don't show it and she's not like broke up about it she's like oh she my looks god worried and then she walks that was away. my best friend yeah. she was like i was more like oh there's just some trash that they have to clean up off the street i don't know i just think no matter how many i, I know she was newer to it but she obviously had some experience like how could you walk away from that not having like any issues that are seriously addressed yeah. in the movie well by rubbing uh richard Gere's nipples in a bathtub i believe i believe that resurges like your soul you know you kind of re- it, it heals does. everything he has regenerative nipples yeah um they had the power so would to you, heal would you say her transformation in any way was like empowered by the self or was it all just i don't think by the man here's the thing i don't think that she was really transformed internally she had a makeover, which was... Yeah, money. but she said she didn't want to do this anymore. And she said she wants to work on herself now. Okay, I might have slept through that part. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, maybe she was just grossed out by him um, and by Stucky forcing himself on her. And was like, you know what? I'm done. $100 an hour is not worth it. And lucky which, for her, she didn't have a substance abuse problem that she was yeah, trapped just in really the cycle. Flossing. And that's the other thing. She made it so easy to quit. It was like, well, I decide I'm quitting, so I'm done. Yeah. Because she also didn't have a pimp. She did not have a pimp. They not going to have a that. pimp taking her money from her. Yeah. Um, just these things are not um, accurate. I, s- with uh, us mentioning, well, with me mentioning the character from Trading Places played by Ralph Bellamy, um, Trading Places has Jamie Lee Curtis playing a prostitute. That's and, uh, believable. I don't remember her in Trading Places, but I can see Jamie Lee Curtis playing a pretty actor. Well, and she's she's kind of the hooker with the heart of gold there too. But in that movie, Dan Aykroyd's life is basically destroyed. He loses everything, and she sets very hard like hard rules with him. And she's a very realistic persona, and Was she's a very like, like realized character. No touching. Well, she's like you know you can sleep in my bed, but we're not like doing anything. Like I I work for this you know i do all this stuff and yeah it was it was more nuanced than this i won't say it's a perfect depiction but i mean that movie's older than this and it was a more nuanced depiction um the part i'd like to see what happens to them like three years from now because richard Gere's character has established these a pretty much a piece of shit he's a horrible person to be in a relationship with he divorces his wife he dumps his girlfriend over the phone and he doesn't have time to be as he put it in a woman's uh, beck and call so I mean he's already shown her exactly who he is and the only endearing quality about him is he's really rich and can afford to let her do literally anything super rich he can afford to let her do whatever she wants whatever her desire would be 
But as a person, I don't know. I don't think he changed. And I think she's going to move to New York with him. They're maybe going to get engaged or something. And then he's just, she's going to realize he's still totally into his business and doesn't have time for her. That sounds like it could be a plot line in Sex in the City. It does, doesn't it? And I, I, would, I think he's a lot like Big. Um, juvenile. Controlling. Juvenile, controlling. Um, yeah. It, he has very Trump qualities to him. I mean, that's that sleazy, 80s power man kind of thing. So. Yeah. So, I don't know. So, obviously, you weren't that impressed with this film. No, I definitely wasn't. I would suggest uh, if you were wanting to watch a movie about prostitutes or hookers, um, not to watch this one. Watch Escorts on Netflix, and you'll at least get to see a bunch of really fake boobs Hmm. and a, a real, a more realistic and super depressing account of what it's like to be an escort in the UK, in Cheerio, London town. Where a high class escort can make five hundred dollars a night, and uh, pops bottles of champagne, not because they have a drinking problem, but because they like to celebrate. Um, definitely more accurate depiction of the sadness of the profession. So one last thing, um, the poster, the famous poster for Pretty Woman with Julia Roberts leaning on Richard Gere, has she- some has some weird uh, some weird things going on here. Uh, first of all, he has brown hair in the trailer. In the trailer, in the poster, just completely brown hair. They painted his hair brown for the poster. It doesn't even make sense. And then, um, on top of that, it's actually Julia Roberts had superimposed on a lady named Shelley Michelle, and uh, they used some photographs of her in a very re- revealing outfit and put Julia Roberts' head square on top of it. Um, hmm. I was gonna say Julia Roberts' character never wears that outfit. She wears a similar outfit to the cover, uh, the poster outfit, but it's not she the same does. one. It's like a wife beater that's been cut the sides yeah, of it out. And like and safety pin to her skirt or safety something. Safety pin to like a washcloth for the yeah. bottom. Uh, so it, it's kind of interesting that they went through that trouble to just use somebody else for it, paint Richard Gere's hair, and it's kind of inconsequential. But I just thought that was neat. Any other thoughts? Not really. I mean, I feel like I've already thought about this movie um, more than I ever wanted to. Oh, one final thought. Probably the most important thing that happened in the movie, and we didn't talk about it, and I'm going to talk about it right now because I'll die a little inside if we don't get this out. So there's one scene in the movie where she's in the bathtub, which is like four scenes in the movie where she's in the bathtub, but this is just one of them. And Richard Gere gets a phone call in their penthouse and he's like in the living room and as you do you you want to walk around while you're talking on the phone the good thing this phone has a really long cord so he's like wa- walking from the living room down the hallway into the bathroom mind you on a corded phone in the penthouse in the penthouse and he's like walking around the tub and I, I just looked at Max and I was like, how long is that phone cord? <laughs> like, does it, is it just like endlessly retractable from the wall? He easily walked 40 to 50 feet. At least. Yeah. And he didn't like get it wrapped around no. anything. He wasn't tugging at it. And, and cordless phones existed at this time. They did. He had a cell phone. Yeah. Um. So, yeah. How, how could we have forgotten that part? It didn't really fit into everything else we're talking about, but it was a funny moment to it notice that the phone moment. cord kept going and going. And that's, uh, it's funny because that kind of that kind of thing can take you out of the movie for a second. You could be like, there's some production assistant who has to carry the phone cord behind him like 10 feet back to make that, sure he can go there. Or do you think that it just had a long phone cord just dangling off of it? So he just started I think it was just unplugged free. most likely and yeah. somebody held it to make it look like it was taut. So. Yeah. So if you watch it, I want you to look out for that scene and uh, send the send Max and Scott a, a little email. Tell them how long you think that phone cord really was. So, Max, where could the good people find us? Well, you could find us hitchhiking to Disneyland or you can find us at thecriticalbreakdown.com. You can find me trying to figure out how to drive manually down the highway or you can find me on Twitter at Max Rivera Film. 
you can find me maxing out my credit card at Target and saying to myself, big mistake, huge. Or you can find me on Instagram at Cowboy Schnoodle. Uh, and don't forget, if you uh, if you can't find Scott at his uh, weekly polo game, you can find him at Breakdown Scott Breakdown underscore Scott on Instagram. You're gonna see some good pictures of Mickey on that on that Insta. Josh Rivera did our artwork. Jason Brown did our music. And Wally, who's celebrating a very special two year anniversary with us, is the podcast dog. And we're the sexy ladies. Next week on The Critical Breakdown. We're watching Contact, rated 62% on Rotten Tomatoes. So beautiful.